Sup guys, Heeking here, bringing you a movie review. It's been a long bloody while since I did a video. I was busy, uh, and Christmas is now over. So yeah, we're on the uh, 27th of Boxing Day was yesterday. So yeah, it's been a while. How long has it been actually? I don't even remember. I think it's been a month, maybe a few more, a good few six, seven weeks maybe. Hey man, I've been busy, okay? So, but hey, I'm back now and... Yeah, uh, one of the bigger hurdles is seeing how I'm going to edit all of this because I'm not using Final Cut Pro anymore. <laughs> I don't have that. I don't have access to that. So now I'm using some uh, weird version uh, called Lightwork. So yeah, I'm trying to get used to that. So yeah, let's see how this goes, right? So yeah, movie review. I'm going to be talking about the uh, Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City film. So yeah, it finally came out. It came out on demand. And I watched it. I finally got to see it and I thought I'd share my thoughts on it. And yeah, I'm very conflicted when it comes to this movie movie. Um I don't know no I don't really know what to say to be honest. Uh if you if you know my opinions on the other movies, you'd know I really, really didn't like what they did with uh, the Paul W.S. Anderson movies, uh, the Mina Jehovah ones. I liked the first one back in, uh, back when it came out in, what, 2002? Um, Apocalypse, I thought, was fun. You know, it's the closest we got to, like, a Resident Evil 3, a Nemesis adaptation. But after that, the, the movies just so, sort of went their own way. And, you know, I'd be fine with an alternative universe if they just sort of stuck to their own... Uh, rules of what they established and to their own lore and uh, mythology but they just kept changing and cutting and uh, just jumping time and doing crazy weird crap and it just didn't make any sense like Resident Evil Extinction was is a fun film but at the same time it's it's ridiculous it's just utterly insane and then with Afterlife uh, Retribution and then the final chapter it just it just kept getting worse it was a case of a movie of like how much worse can we make these films, right, instead of having some sort of logical plot that sort of ties into the games? And uh, the character of Alice did not help things. You know, Mila Jovovich being the main character did not help things. Her character does not exist in the games. It never should have been her. You know, it, it never should have focused on her. They should have just used the game characters from the start uh, and just sort of tried to adapt their way around that. This movie tries to do that. It tries to adapt the games mainly Resident Evil 1 and Resident Evil 2 and combines the two of them together to give you this one film, right? And it uses the game characters, okay? The main characters in this are consist of uh, Claire Redfield, Chris Redfield, Jill Valentine, um, Leon S. Kennedy and Albert Wesker. Uh, Ada Wong does cameo in the movie at the very, very bloody end. And other characters from the games also appear like Richard Alkin, Enrico Marino, Dooley, and Chief Irons, and Bren Brutalacci, Sherry Birkin, Annette Birkin, William Birkin, etc, etc. Uh, but none of these characters really feel like their game counterparts, uh, which is going to be one of the biggest problems of this movie. Um, again, like I said, it's very hard to talk about this one, but uh, did I think it was a good film? Okay, that's the first thing we should actually do. Did I think this was a good film? If I do go right into this, uh, remember guys to like and subscribe. So yeah. Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City. Okay, first of all, the story, honestly, uh, one of the biggest complaints has always been how can you adapt these into films, right? And it doesn't really work. And it's kind of true, you know, I've tried sitting down writing my own fan scripts for these and I've written so many drafts of just the first game, right? You know, uh, as a movie adaptation and it, it just, it, it sort of works and it sort of doesn't because you have to sort of sit there and go, what am I going to cut out because of budget? Uh, what characters am I going to keep? What characters am I going to kill off? Etc, etc. And, uh, you know, you, re you really need a good idea of how you're going to balance all of this and, you know, unless it's a TV show, I don't think as a movie format it works. But this film sort of showed that, no, you can do it. You can actually do it. You can pull it off. But there's still going to be flaws and mistakes. And this movie has a lot of flaws and mistakes. And stops it from being a really good adaptation. Like, it's not a terrible film per se. But, and as an adaptation, to be honest, uh, in terms of a story adaptation, it's pretty fine, actually. But, in terms of how it's structured and paced, that's where it sort of loses the plot. 
So you've got you've got basically Resident Evil 1 and you've got Resident Evil 2 and it combines those two stories together, okay? It tells the story of uh, Chris Redfield, Joe Valentine, Albert Wesker going to the Spencer Mansion while at the same time telling the story of Raccoon City getting infected and being overrun by zombies while, you know, uh, Leon and Claire work together to try and escape from there and get out. And... In terms of how they do that, you know what? It works pretty bloody fine. The movie starts with a flashback uh, showing us a young Claire and young Chris being uh, in a, you know, growing up in an orphanage, and this orphanage is inspired by the orphanage from Resident Evil 2 Remake, uh, and it's run by William Birkin. So already you've got this sort of little tie in there, and it works for the most part. Uh, what doesn't work is uh, is the so, sort of additions they put into it, like Lisa Trevor, for example. You know, Lisa Trevor appears in this, and, you know, you think she's going to be this horrible monster, like, like in the original remake game, but no, that's not the case. Here, she's basically the good monster, basically sort of hiding in that, and being uh, the experiment that's responsible for birthing the G-Virus, like, uh, it's written in the files, you can even look at the trailer and pause it when it, when you, when you get to that shot of the files that Claire is reading, and it literally tells you the whole thing with Progenito and the, and the G-Virus, etc, etc, uh, I mean, unless you're a game fan and you know this detail, uh, this movie doesn't really go into detail explaining those elements, so you've got Claire, who befriends, uh, you know, Lisa Trevor, and she obviously knows that something is going on in this orphanage, and we get these little flashbacks where she was taken by Birkin to be experimented on, but she escapes in the weirdest way possible. She she escapes, and then she leaves Raccoon City, and she never t you know never comes back again until a few years later. Um, for some reason, uh, Chris was uh, raised and helped by Birkin and Umbrella, and. He, you know, besides a few lines of dialogue and pictures, it's like, oh yeah, William Birkin was there for me, he was like my father figure. You don't really get any moments when, between these two characters when they're older and that. Like, I feel like this movie could have used more flashbacks in order to flesh out some of these character interactions and these histories. Because it's interesting as hell, but they don't really do anything with it. In terms of the story structure of combining 1 and 2, I think that works pretty bloody well. Um, you've got Claire coming back. And this is at this point where the city sort of is falling apart. They explain, like, you know, Raccoon City in this movie is not like Raccoon City from the games. In the, in the games, Raccoon City is a small Midwestern town, but, you know, it's it's thriving. You know, under Umbrella, it's thriving. With here, with this movie adaptation, it's the opposite. Umbrella is basically like this parasite that has sucked out all the life out of Raccoon City, and they've basically pulled out and left and gone to a new location, and now Raccoon City is suffering. Umbrella has left them to rot, basically, you know, like a leech that sucks out all the blood and leaves you do it, leaves you high and dry. That's sort of like what's going on here, and I like that theme of, of Umbrella being this parasite that just, like, leeches off you and then it leaves you to, to rot and die. And that's kind of what's going on here, and the movie tries to explain, like, the whole, oh, uh, the, the city is now run by a skeleton crew, basically. You know, not a lot of people aren't living here, or at least impl pl employer-wise, you know, it, it, it explains why there's not a big, giant police force, or etc, etc. You know, that's fine. I didn't mind that, actually. I thought that was really well done. What I do have a problem with is, is the fact that you could have had more characters in this movie because, uh, you know, like, you, you, you've got, you've got, like, Irons running the uh, RPD, right? And you've got the Stars team, which consists of, um, you know, Chris, Jill, Wesker, and Richard, and, uh, you know, Mar Mar uh, what, uh, what, what was his name again? Enrico and uh, Dooley, was it? And that's that's just seven people, really. Like, those seven people are meant to be stars members, and it just consists of them. And then you've got Leon, who's the RPD guy. He's the rookie. So I, I don't I don't get where how how it differentiates between stars and RPD. Does that make sense? It's a bit weird how it's done like that. And then you've got Irons as the big... So really, when you think about it, there's only, like... There's literally like uh, eight to nine police officers here. And really, there should have been more. There should have been more of these characters. It makes sense why Barry and Rebecca wouldn't be in this, because then the movie would be too long, but also because then they would probably end up being cannon fodder. So, you know, you don't want to use characters just to kill them off. So they only they, 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 they give you the main game characters, and then they give you some characters that are obviously going to die in this movie. And that's fine. But, like, I would have liked to have seen Marvin Brannigan, for example, like, at the reception instead of Leon and that. Uh, it would have been kind of cool to see those kind of elements, if that makes sense. Um, because otherwise, uh, the RPD just feels very, very dead. 
and that also uh, implies to the city as well. The city just feels very, very dead. Like uh, you've got this one diner, you've got Claire and the and and the, and the Redfield uh, uh, household and the neighbor next door, and I feel like that's pretty much it. You don't really you don't really see anyone else. Obviously, you've got the infected people coming out, but like you don't get a sense of oh, this city is, like, alive and that. Does that make sense? So, it just feels very empty and dead. Yeah, you've got an empty town, essentially, which doesn't make it for a very exciting, big, grand movie. Uh, I have to say, this movie does have a very B-horror movie quality to it, which, again, it, it's fine. You know, the old Resident Evil games had this sort of B-level to it. They weren't this big A-grade games that they are now. But, you know, the original games that did have this B-horror movie element to it. And these movies sort of transfer to that. You know, it's got this very sort of cheap-looking uh, feel to it. And it, it works for the most part. But, again, I, I could have... I would have preferred a bit more lively lot of people to be here. You know, just to give you a good sense of... There is people living here. There are people suffering. You don't really get the whole scope of... Oh, my God, things are falling apart. You just get a few quick glimpses. And then you're just sort of meant to go like... Oh, right, okay, yeah, everyone's died. The movie doesn't really explain how people are getting infected. You only get this sort of like one line from uh, Ben Brutalacci during this like video where it's like, it's in the water, like people are getting infected through the water. And it's like, so people are getting infected through the war, okay. Why why aren't people like Chris and, and the other RP, you know, the RPD the officers getting infected, right? Like, and I, and I think there's like this one line later on where it's like, oh yeah, you probably take your vitamins or, or whatever. And it's like, oh, is that what's keeping them alive or keeping them immune? Like, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I really would have preferred if this movie had attempted to adapt uh, the whole, like, reason for why Raccoon City goes to crap in the first place. Maybe we could have, you know, instead of William Burke, we could have gotten, like, James Marcus, for example. Like, he's the one who's running the labs, whatever, and then Spencer, whatever, uh, or the Umbrella team comes in and they, they try to take the T-virus. Something happens, it all breaks apart, he gets killed, the virus gets released, and then, boom, you've got a reason for why the city is getting affected in the very first few minutes. You establish these elements. But instead, the movie is... The movie never really explains things, to be honest, in terms of how, like, oh yeah, how this is happening. It's just, yeah, yeah, our, our, our brother did their thing, left the town, and now everyone's sick. It's like, oh, okay. Okay. Like, at, at least the Paul W.S. Anderson movie had an explanation for why things went the way they did in the first movie. Here it's just like, yeah, we don't really know. It's in the water. Like, oh, okay, that, that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Yeah, great. Uh... So you've got, like I said, you've got Claire coming back. You've got you've got her coming back on the uh, truck from Resident Evil 2. Um, again, again, if you've seen the trailers and you've paid attention, you know exactly what's going to happen. They hit a person. Big panic, like, oh my god, I hit someone. The person gets up, walks away off screen, and they don't even realise it. Like, it's literally right there. Somehow they just, they, they manage to get up without making a noise and... and walk off into the forest, uh, the door gets with the truck driver, it, you know, uh, licks the blood, it gets infected, ends up biting the truck driver, truck driver gets infected. Uh, one of the things they do with this movie in terms of the virus that I thought was really well done and original is the fact that uh, you don't straight up turn into a zombie, right? What happens is you sort of start to lose, it's sort of a combination of the rage virus from uh, 28 days later, like you start sort of like losing your crap, you start bleeding from the eyes, uh, you start losing your hair, and then you just you just go really mentally insane very quickly. And I thought that was really bloody well done. And so, of, in terms of like showcasing, like, oh yeah, this thing, this thing is like, like you know, holy crap. And then and then you turn into a zombie. Like with the way the dog is, it it looks like it's like getting rabies, right? And and the eyes are going all milky. And then it, it bites the truck driver. But it's not eating him yet, it's just sort of looking at him and the truck driver's like bleeding eyes, you know, red eyes coming out and then he ends up crushing and losing control and boom. Um, very interesting stuff there. Um, Claire meets her brother Chris, we get this little interaction and uh, she's trying to show him her the videos of this guy that she met over or, or over the internet basically, Ben Brutalacci, who's this like conspiracist instead of uh, uh, the reporter that he is in the games. And obviously he doesn't believe her. And it, you know they leave on the they leave on bad terms basically, and he he ends up going to the RPD station, and Claire ends up taking uh gets ends up getting attacked first by the neighbors obviously, and that's when she realizes holy crap there's there's things going wrong here, and she ends up taking the bike to escape, running into William Birkin who at the same time gets a call from someone, and he ends up taking his family, he takes up uh, Net and Sherry to head to wherever they're heading to to the Nest Lab, 
and you don't really see those characters again until the towards the very end of the film and holy crap this movie could have used more Birkin it could have used more like you know showing him arriving at the lab he's uh, bringing his family in and them sort of going like what the hell's going on and explaining things a bit better but they're just sort of there like you could have just cut Sherry and Annette from the movie they didn't have to be there does that make sense like they didn't have to be there they're just sort of thrown in without any character development they're just there in the background and then you just sort of you know as a game fan you sort of went to go oh yeah it's Annette and Sherry but it's like they don't even look like them which uh, it's just very confusing and then of course you got the whole uh, Resident Evil 1 side of things where you know, Bravo team goes missing in the forest because they heard about, like, uh, murders or whatever. So, uh, you know, the stars team gets sent in by helicopter, they land in the forest. You get this very cool scene where you see these characters interact and meet uh, at first in the state, you know, in, in, a, in a diner with Leon. He's sort of there, and then Leon in the station. So it's nice to see, like, uh, the stars team interact. You kind of get a good idea of their personalities and that. So, you know, it's something that we've never seen in the games. We've only sort of read about it in the books. There's a lot of, I, I, I like to say, there's a lot of S.T. Perry... Uh, inspiration here from the novels. You even got this moment where Wesker, like, he, he gets a message, right, and he goes to his locker and he, he ends up getting this device, and it's very similar to what it, what happens in the Umbrella Conspiracy novel, where uh, Trent, uh, this guy who works inside Umbrella, is, like, leaking things and actually helping the stars team, mainly Jill, and he gives her this device to use to sort of find a way around her. That's kind of what's going on here, and I thought that was really cool. That was like, a nice little call back to that. Um, so you got the stars team landing. There's no dogs here, obviously. You only get one dog in this movie. There's no chase sequence where they get chased by the dogs. They head into the mansion. They find the truck, uh, which is sort of inspired by Resident Evil Zero, I guess. You know, it's not Billy Cohen. It's the it's the Bravo team truck. Uh, and, and, and they head into the mansion and uh, in terms of set locations they did a really good job sort of recreating uh, the front uh, uh, elements of... of, of uh, of the locations from the games, basically, you know, you've got the mansion hall from the original game, you've got the uh, RPD hall from the uh, and, and gate from the original game, you've got the orphanage sort of like uh, entrance from from the remake. So it's nice, it's nice. They got these little elements there that are like sort of like 99% recreated from there, and it's like cool, like you got the set pieces right. But when it comes to characters, you got that completely wrong. Um, so you got you got the stars team heading into the mansion. You got the typical like they split up like in pairs to look uh, for things. You got Wesker using the device to find his way around. Uh, he ends up playing the uh, piano basically, which is a nice little Easter egg. He plays the piano, which ends up uh, and he plays Moonlight Sonata by the way to open to do the puzzle to open the secret entrance that leads into Nest. So that was pretty cool. Uh, in terms of differences, you've got. Uh, the, the helicopter that they're on, uh, you know, Brad Bickens, he doesn't escape with the helicopter. Instead, he gets attacked uh, by zombies in the woods. And he ends up crashing the helicopter into where Jill and Wesker are, which causes an explosion and knocks them out. And Jill realizes, you know, that, uh, you know, something's going on with Wesker, obviously. Like, he, know, he knows certain things, he's doing certain things. And, uh, yeah, like I said, in terms of characters, the, the personalities are very, very different. In terms of Easter eggs... Like I said, with the Moonlight Sonoto and the freaking piano, there's a lot of Easter eggs like that. You've got this one moment where, uh, when uh, Jill like uh, gets to the RPD station, uh, she uh, and um, holy crap, how do I say this? Like I'm, I'm, I'm sort of like spoiling the movie at this point, aren't I? You've got this moment where they uh, lay on like they they meet Lisa Trevor right, and she gives them keys, and it's the, basically the, uh, the 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 card. The card keys, basically, the club keys. You've got the club, diamond, heart, like, keys, basically. And she uses the club key to open the secret entrance in the orphanage that leads into the uh, nest lab, basically. Which is pretty bloody cool. It's little, it's little things like that. Especially, like, the truck driver and the cheeseburger, for example. Or, or Wesco with his uh, samurai edge. Like, he's using the actual samurai edge that he uses in the games. Or him getting the sunglasses later on. A lot, a lot of little Easter eggs like that thrown in there, which is pretty cool. Um... But, good God, like I said, in terms of, like, story and that, like, uh, and characters, they could have done a better job. Uh, uh, like I said, the story structure-wise, in terms of the, uh, of how they do it, of how they combine one or two, works pretty well. Jill gets to the RPD station. You've got uh, uh, Chief Irons, who basically leaves Leon in charge. He tries to escape the city, but the city, like, gets locked down by Umbrella security forces, and they start killing any uh, people trying to leave. So Irons is forced to escape back to the RPD station. He gets attacked by the infected dog from the truck. Um, he gets saved by Claire. 
and then uh, she meets up with Leon and him, and, and and you know they all decide to escape to the orphanage basically because Iron says that there's a there's a secret way to escape because he knows Leon. Leon and Claire and, and Iron basically decide to escape to the orphanage which is a bit weird because this movie never really dwells into the whole of Iron's uh, working for Umbrella like it, it's very confusing like they don't really dwell his character is very different he's played by the guy who plays uh, Bollock I think in, in Gotham's uh, he's a pretty good actor by, by the way in this movie but like in terms of uh, in terms of his Irons right it's a bit weird I like it I do like it there's some funny moments that he has but uh, it, it's sort of a nice mixture of his irons from the original, I guess, sort of game of him being corrupt and maybe the version, or at least being an arsehole, and and the version that they changed in the in the one from the one point five version of Resident Evil Two, where he's like a good guy basically. Like it would have been nice to sort of get a mixture of this character, like like. But they know they don't they never really dwell into his bribery side. So I never I I don't know if there's scenes that they cut from this movie where they showcase that he is he is taking bribes from Umbrella or not. So it's very confusing what why how his character knows all this stuff and he's like yeah we're gonna go to the orphanage because there's a secret entrance we can take and go and escape from uh, the city from that way and it's like okay he knows he knows certain things but like other than that it's like they don't really dwell into it um, so they had they head to the freaking uh, orphanage basically they, they use the RPD to escape to go through the back door while they're getting chased by zombies and they're firing their guns away and, the, and then they get outside and they, 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 they head for the orphanage at the same time You've got the stars team infiltrating the mansion. Wesker's already made his way. He he he, he does the secret entrance thing. Jill and and he ends up saving Jill from like a, I think I think a zombie Brad that comes out of the helicopter. I could be wrong. Uh, and he ends up explaining to her that he's been you know he's been uh, he's working for uh, someone uh, to in order to get evidence or to shut down Umbrella basically and and telling them that uh, he was going to leave them to die basically. Uh, this version of Wesker is very conflicted which i don't mind i think it's a very different but cool kind of version to go with um and there's also this sort of romantic uh tension they kind of do with jill and him which is just bloody weird um at the same time you've got chris and richard investigating the mansion and they get overwhelmed by hordes of zombies you get that little classic uh, first zombie turn from the original game uh, richard gets killed in the most uh basic way ever like uh, there's no sacrifice here like he just gets overwhelmed and gets eaten by the zombies and chris is stuck having to fight his way through these hordes and there's this one cool sequence where like all the lights basically go out and he's only got a gun and, and a knife and a lighter basically and he's trying to f find his way around like uh, these hordes of zombies and he's getting overwhelmed and he ends up like using all the ammo in his gun uh to using a knife to uh yeah having to like keep these things back until jill ends up coming in and saving his life and she ends up telling him yeah, what happened like yeah wesker left us to die he's betrayed us blah 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 so they end up using the entrance to chase after him uh claire and uh leon and uh chief irons they get to the orphanage and uh, they encounter uh, lisa trevor who was still living there for some reason i i, I don't get her in, you know involvement in this movie like why is she there why is she free to roam around the orphanage why is the umbrella people not doing anything right and then at the same time you've got the introduction of the liquor which is very weird because the liquor just sort of comes out of nowhere like it's in the orphanage like hiding about like lisa trevor knows about it she like she warns leon to like whoosh, like to keep bloody quiet but yeah for whatever bloody reason it, it's there like um, it's so weird because uh, uh, when 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 the out when the stars team goes to the forest right and they find Bravo team's car, it's got like huge scratches on it. So you're meant to assume that something attacked them in the woods that forced them to run into the mansion before they got killed. And my assumption would be it was the liquor, right? But then how does the how does the liquor from from the mansion from all the way there? get all the way to the orphanage right like it's just it's just very bloody weird like it makes no sense um the way Birkin and his family end up in the lab doesn't make any sense because obviously they would have had to have gone to the mansion right unless they drove all the way to because they they basically explain that there's two there's two ways to get to the to the nest lab there's one from the spencer mansion in the forest and there's one from the city in the orphanage and you basically one takes like a giant freaking elevator down and the other one's like a big long tunnel from the for, from the from the spencer mansion forest all the way to where the lab is um so obviously Berkey would have had to have gone for the orphanage right and i guess he had a, a set of spare keys to use to open the lock there because 
Why is there a spare of six? It doesn't make any sense. It's stuff like that that sort of makes me think, go, oh, wow, okay. This is following the video game logic of things, do you know what I mean? Of a character being in a room, but you need a key to open it, and then, and then you find that character in there, and it's like, oh, oh, hello there, character. How did you get in here? Oh, I, I, you had the spare keys? Well, why didn't you just give them to me instead of me having to do all these puzzles? That, do you know what I mean? It's just sort of really mind-blowingly confusing. Uh, so you, you, you've got Irons who gets killed by the liquor, and I have to say, when it comes to gore, this movie is the least goriest of, of, of the other films, like at least with the original Resident Evil, you had people getting sliced and diced, for example, by that bloody laser, but here it's like, it's like, oh yeah, people are getting bitten, blah, and die. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention, by the way, that uh, when 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 Leon meets, uh, meets Claire and they're, and they're trying to get out, uh, they uh, all take the back door, get the key, or whatever it is, like they're in the armory, right? Uh, uh, Leon hears some noises and he goes to investigate and he, he investigates the prison cells where Ben Brutalacci is. And obviously he knows he's crap, he mentions the T-virus and the G-virus and he's acting all hipster and shit. And then he gets, he, he takes Leon's gun, right? And he tries to make him to, uh, like look for the keys to open the gate so he can get out. And, he, he, and there's, a, there's another prisoner in the cell with him that's clearly infected. Instead of taking the gun and shooting this guy in the head, knowing that he's probably going to bite him or kill him, he's just like, yeah, hurry up and open the door, hurry up and open the door. And by the time he opens the door, he gets attacked, gets his throat chewed out, and he dies. And it's like, there you go, blah, blah, blah. And, yeah, it's just it's just so weird. Like, I don't mind that part, to be honest. But at the same time, it's like, because Claire had a connection to him, it would have been nice, maybe, to have these two characters interact instead of it just being Leon doing these little clumsy ass shit because Leon in this movie is is basically played like an idiot basically he's not it's so weird what they do with Leon in this movie uh, it's weird what they do with a lot of characters in this movie and, I, and I'm gonna get to that I'm gonna get to explaining about all the characters and how they dif differentiate but yeah uh, back to back to present time of uh, Leon and Claire's story they, 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 they meet Lisa Trevor she saves them from the liquor she ends up ripping through it and killing it uh, she ends up giving the keys, she uses the keys, uh, and they say goodbye, and that's it, you never see Lisa Trevor again, you just sort of say, friend, Claire, and it's like, that's it, goodbye, Le goodbye Lisa Trevor, we hardly knew you, it's like, what, what was the point of introducing this uh, iconic monster and character, if you're not gonna use her in any interesting way, do you know what I mean, it's just, it's mind-blowingly dumb at this point. So Leon and Claire head down, using the elevator, they get to the lab, well, technically, they get to like some sort of secret area where they took, where they would take the kids to experiment them on, and she finds all these little video files, uh, uh, and one of them is basically a, a, a recreation of the uh, Ashford twins uh, scene from Call Veronica, where you have got the two kids sort of looking at each other and they're throwing the uh, dragonfly where they rip the wings off and they throw it into a nest of ants that eat them, and then in this version, you've got Birkin sort of observing them. Uh, obviously, this is a setup for, for a Cold Veronica sequel, basically. Like, oh yeah, if, the, if we're going to get a sequel, it's going to be Cold Veronica. And yeah, that's cool. It's it's nice to sort of set that up. Uh, and and Claire just sort of gets upset. Like, oh my god, they would bring all the kids, blah, blah, blah. You know, blah, blah, blah. You know, typical emotional crap. Blah, blah, blah. Leon calms her down, and then the, the two of them go on their way. Uh, Wesker ends up getting to the lab, which is just, you know, you know, you, it, it's weird that they call this the lab, like, you, the cheapness of it is just mind-boggingly stupid, like, I, I just, wow, like, it, 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 it's, it, it's at this point where it's like, man, they really should have given them more budget to at least create some sort of bigger set pieces here, because, like, it's, it's just a freaking storage room, basically, you know, you've got this zombie that's, that's in, in an operating table, and you've got Annette and Sherry there, like, looking at it while Bur Birkin's doing his thing, Wesker comes in, obviously, these versions of the characters don't know each other, they don't, uh, they, you know, Wesker didn't work for Umbrella, he's just, he is just a guy, um, Hold on a second to let Loki out. What's up, buddy? Yeah, go on. Sorry about that. So, yeah, uh, Wesker. Sorry about the camera placement there. So, yeah, Wesker. Um, as you would have guessed it if, you, if you've been paying attention, you know a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, Birkin gets killed early on. It's like, no, that doesn't happen. Birkin dies at the very end of this movie, okay? Wesker comes in, and he's like, I need, I need, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the G-Virus, blah, blah, blah. And he ends up, sh he, uh, both Birkin and him end up shooting each other, right? Um, 
So uh, yeah, but, but Birkin just he just gets he, he just gets shot multiple times by Wesker and he falls down and as he's dying he gives the gun to Annette to to attack Wesker with and Wesker's like don't you do anything don't you try you can sort of see that he doesn't want to kill her like he he didn't he didn't want to kill any of them like they attacked him first she turns around to shoot at him and Wesker just like pops off the gun like reflex wise and puts a bullet in her head so she falls down dead and he, and Wesker just sort of like he gets pissed because like he didn't want to kill them he didn't come here to kill them. And uh, it, it's and then obviously like he's trying to get the samples right, and he and he sees that Birkin has has, has injected himself with the with the G virus, and Wesker just puts more bullets in him, and um, and then and and he, as he's trying to leave, all wounded and injured, you've got Sherry coming up, picking up the gun, and trying to shoot him, and Wesker obviously at this moment we're like, is he gonna shoot the little girl as well? Like uh, clearly he's conflicted. Is he gonna shoot her? And before we can see if he does, uh, Jill ends up shooting him from behind. So he falls down, and you got Chris and Jill enter entering the room. Uh, Chris is comforting uh, Sherry while Jill is having a final moment with Wesker. And Wesker's like, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I did all of this. Blah blah blah. Uh, Umbrella is gonna destroy the entire city. Uh, you know, at like uh, there's 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 this whole thing where when Wesker gets the um, he gets the device from the locker room, right? That gives him the little message about using the device. Uh, it tells it gives a message saying that he's got like six hours or something to to get what he has to get from the lab and escape the city because it's gonna get destroyed at six a.m. So there's this there's this time that continuously plays throughout the film, like twelve uh, twelve p.m. or a.m. Uh, one a.m. Uh, uh, four fifteen uh, a.m. Whatever, like it keeps cut like going like obviously it's going up to that time of like six a.m. in terms of like yeah we're getting closer to the end of the city being destroyed and Wesker tells them that and he tells them to use the train to escape he apologizes to them and then he dies and it's like oh well, well that's sad and then of course obviously Chris and Jill and Sherry end up uh, meeting with Leon and Claire who are in the same area at this point so all five of these characters they get they they, they go to get on the train to escape but Birkin ends up regenerating and he turns into his uh, form one version and he ends up uh, attacking chasing after Jill and Chris um, and, and for some reason he knows that Chris is there and, and he starts like saying all these lines like oh Chris you little you little talk you little pawn blah 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 you know and it's like well hold on a second uh, why is he shitting on Chris for it when the movie first starts right and, and, and you see like you see that relationship with him and Chris like young Chris early on it's like clearly he cares he, he cares slightly about him. he must have cared enough about him that he would be there as a father figure and help him through like him becoming a cop and that etc etc but here he just goes off all nuts like Chris, you're an idiot, blah blah blah, you're stupid, your sister was smarter. So yeah, uh, what my biggest complaint with this is like one minute you've got you've got this whole relationship established between Chris and Birkin, right? And now it's like, oh, he doesn't he never gave a shit about Chris to begin with. It's so weird that they do this. Because I feel I feel like they could have done something very emotional here where it's like he gets mutated maybe and then and like obviously like E, he wants to get revenge on Wesker or whatever, but he's already dead, right? So now, you know, there's no, there's no, it's so weird why he does this, like, it's just, and now he's going after Chris, and I mean, you could have had this moment where maybe he's trying to struggle, maybe he's struggling not to kill him, and he's like, maybe he's like, you know, I'm sorry for what I did, you, you, you gotta protect my door, or, or something like that, instead of he goes on full villain mode, and it's like, what the hell, right? Um, Whatever I guess, uh, Claire ends up coming in. I think it's Claire. I could be wrong, and or or maybe it's Chris. I don't know. I I, I forget at this point. Uh, I've already seen this film once, in it. So they attack him and they shoot him, and then obviously, boom, there goes form one. So now, and I think Chris ends up putting a bullet into his head. Like, yeah, you know, there's literally a bullet in his head. So now Birkin is dead. So they go on the train and they escape, and then it gets to six a.m. and in the, the entire, you know, instead of the city exploding, for some reason the entire city collapses. So it's like a freaking earthquake, like everything just goes down into a crater. I, I don't know how this would stop the infection of that. I mean, I mean there's, no, there's no fire here, do you know what I mean? Like a missile strike makes more sense than just obliterating thing from the ground down. Like it's just, it's weird. So you've got the, the tunnel collapsing as the train is trying to escape. And the train gets derailed so they get stuck. And it's at this point that Birkin in his uh, new form whatever attacks them. And this form, I guess, is a mix of the... It's basically a version of Form 3 with the giant art hands, but without without the two extra ones coming out. So you've got him ripping the top of the train down, and he comes down, he attacks Claire, Chris goes in, shooting, pop, 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 pop. You've got Leon and Jill in the front of the train, driving it. You've got Sherry there, 
uh, that Chris is trying to protect. Uh, Claire ends up getting a knife out and stabbing uh, Birkin's uh, original face through the chest. Uh, he throws her down. Uh, Chris is popping off bullets, on, uh, popping off the eyeballs basically. And then Leon ends up coming in with an RPG and uses it to kill Birkin and that's it. You know, Birkin dies, he saves the others and that's it. And it's like, it's so, again, it's so confusing because... Uh, and this is where I'm going to get to the point of the characters now. Um, and I'm going to get to that. But yeah, uh, Leon kills Birkin. And then the five of them leave the train and they escape. And you've got this thing at the end where it's like, uh, you know, Rocket City destroyed, Spencer Mansion destroyed, Obliterated, whatever, Ness destroyed, Survivor zero, except them five, you know, that they live. So it, it looks like Umbrella is unaware that five of these guys end up, ended up escaping. And then the movie ends. Resident Evil, welcome to Raccoon City. Oh my God. And then uh, we, it, our end credit scene or mid credit scene is basically uh, uh, Wesker being revealed to be alive. Somehow he survived. He got rescued by Ada Wong, who he was working for. Uh, she's wearing her little FBI trench coat, basically, and she's like, "Oh, we had to, you know, we had to do some things to rescue our side effects." So he's going blind. So she she gives him the black shades, and now he's like, "I can see again." And he's like, "Who are you?" And it's like Ada, Ada Wong, and then boom, the movie ends there. And yeah, in terms of, like I said, in terms of the pacing, this movie is... <sighs> I'm just really tired talking about this movie, like there's too much to talk about. But okay, like I said, in terms of the plot structure, in terms of how they combine movies, uh, games one and two, I thought it worked really well. The problem is, is that there's not enough, there's not enough exposition, there's not enough character development. Which leads to the problem with this movie, which is the pacing. This movie goes way... It, it starts off way too slow, which is fine. I like the slowness of this, actually. I like the build-up to it. But because this is a an hour and a half long movie, it's an hour and 30 minutes if you don't include credits. If you include credits, I think it's an hour and 40 minutes long. But if you include the credits, like... It's a pretty... You know, if you don't include the credits, it's a pretty short, bloody film, basically. That's what I'm trying to say. And this movie needed to be two hours long. This movie either needed to be two or two hours and a half long in order to really capture the spirit of the games and the game's plot and that. But because it's so bloody short, everything just feels very rushed once we get to the whole game adaptation part. You know, the whole first few minutes, first 20, 30 minutes is basically establishing the world, the city, the characters, and then the last hour is basically the whole game adaptation, basically, of games one and two. And, you know, that could that, that would have worked if this bloody film was longer. And because it's not longer, a lot of things just sort of get rushed. Like I said, you Birkin and his family is hardly in it. You get that one scene with them and then and then and then they try to escape and then you don't see them until the very end of the film when they get killed off. And it's like we could have we could have new scenes of them in the lab, like get, going like Birkin leading them into the lab, and them sort of going like, "What the hell is going on?" And Birkin maybe talking with the higher ups and trying to figure out what's going on and how he's going to escape, whatever. Like we could have new more scenes like that. We could have had a scene of uh, Irons and 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 what his connection to Umbrella is. We don't get that. We could have had a scene. I don't know. There could have been a lot of things they could have done, but this movie just feels way too quick once it gets to a certain point. And then at that point, it's like, "Yeah, we're going, we're going, we're going." And then it's done, and it's like, that was it? Like, holy crap, this movie just went from, like, going really slow, and then suddenly going to, woo, done. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, how did we go from here to here, like, very quickly, do you know what I mean? And it's really depressing, because, like, I was really enjoying the slow build-up of this, basically. Um, in terms of characters... Yeah, the characters in this movie don't do not feel like they're characters from the games at all, and they don't they do not look like they're characters from the games either. Like, and I'm gonna go into this very, very ruthlessly right now. So we got we the main if I had to pick a main character in this, uh, I'd say I'd argue the main character is is Chris and Claire. They're, they're the main characters of this movie. You've got Chris who's pretty much the main focus of the Spencer stuff, and then you've got Claire who's the main focus of pretty much the mo most of the movie. They're, they're the ones who sort of st who sort of start the film basically, and Birkin is basically the villain, um, which is weird because he could have been he could have been an interesting villain, but uh, no, this is this is what we got. This is what we're going for. Um, so Claire, Claire, Claire Redfield, uh, played by the uh, chick who was in the Maze Runner movies, she does a fine job for the most part, but um, 
This movie does uh, a few weird things. Uh, uh, you know, that you've got this scene when she goes to Chris's house and she uses a knife to basically lockpick it and get into his house. So they've given the lockpicking skills to her when it should be Jill. She doesn't have her hair tied up in a ponytail, which would have been... She's got the, uh, she's got the outfit from the Resident Evil 2 remake game. Okay, I guess that's close enough, but still, it would have been nice to get that ponytail there. Um, and she's basically a badass, like, at this point, like, like there's no real struggle here. Um, fine, I guess. Uh, there's no moments with her and Sherry, like, instead of it sort of focuses on Sherry and Chris. It would have been nice, maybe, to establish, maybe, that Chris has a relationship with Sherry because he, he's got that relationship with Birkin. It would have been nice, maybe, like, Chris, uh, or Mr. Redfield, or Uncle Redfield, or Uncle Chris, or something like Do you know what I mean? Like, something like that. They could have done something like that, but we don't get that. We don't get that kind of moment here, so it's kind of weird what they do with the relationships. Um... Chris, uh, um, I, I, I think he's played by, I think his cousin is the guy who plays uh, Green Arrow in the Arrowverse. Again, I could be wrong here, but uh, I thought he was fine. I thought he was the best one, actually, in this movie. He's not the greatest, but when you look at him, you sort of get the idea that if you give this guy good material, he could do a better job. So I feel like he's sort of like the Chris Evans of the Avengers movie. Like, he's got this role... And he's fine. He does. He does. Uh, he does a good job with what he's got. But like you could, you potentially you could see him doing more given the chance. So he was fine. I thought he was, his characterization was pretty fine. I didn't like obviously like how him and Claire are not very close like they used to be. But then he doesn't really believe her. So obviously they're trying to create tension here, meaningless tension if you will. Um, and I would have preferred to see more of a relationship between him and Birkin and him and Sherry maybe as well. Like, but they don't really do that. Like, f f this is the point where this movie could have used those kind of flashbacks, sadly. Jill, Jill is very different from her game counterpart. Jill, as I said, is the master of unlocking. Here we don't really get that. Jill is a gun nut in this movie. She's played by the chick who played a uh, ghost in Ant-Man and the Wasp and, and, and the female bad guy in, in uh, Ready Player One. She does a fine job, to be honest. Uh, I didn't really have a problem with her because Jill in the games is mixed race. You know, if you didn't know this before, big shock. Chris in the video games is Japanese slash French. Yeah, she's a mix of Japanese and French. So she's not an all-white American chick that we were led to believe. No, if you actually read up on her backstory, she's Japanese French. And you know what? It would have been freaking awesome if they'd gotten a French or Japanese actress to play her. But uh, no, we ended up with a mixed race uh, uh, chick here. And you know what? I don't mind it. Her character's fine. But again, the uniform, the costume isn't really accurate. And her attitude is basically, she's a, like I said, she's a gun nut. Which leads me to one of the bigger problems of this movie. Like, you establish her as a gun nut, right? And uh, it, it would have made more sense for her maybe to find the rocket launcher to kill Birkin with at the end of the film instead of it being Leon. It's not being game accurate, you know, you could have been movie accurate and given it to her. It, it's just weird, you know what I mean? And uh, there's also the, the weirdness of them uh, having this relationship between her and Wesker, like, like they're supposed to be an item, or maybe she's the one. It, it, I, I guess they sort of go into this whole thing where she is interested in Wesker. No, Wesker is obviously, he's not really interested, uh, maybe. But uh, that leads me to Wesker's character, and it's like a Wesker in this, in, in this film. Um... I thought was fine. Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, the guy who played Tom Hooper, I think. Uh, funny enough, I, I recognize his name because he was in Game. He was in that one Game of Thrones episode in the last season, I think, or was it season seven? And uh, he also played Billy Boyd in the in Black Sails. So yeah, I like him. I thought I thought he was a good choice. He's got the macho look. He's got the look down. But I like the fact that they give us a Wesker that is not completely evil. You know, I like my villains when they have shades of humanity or shades of grey to them. Where they're not just full out villains. And I thought that was really cool to do. You've got this Wesker here who, he was going to leave, the, you know, his team to die. Obviously because he wanted to get rich very quickly or he, he just hated where he lives and he just wanted to get out. Which is a bit weird because it's like, well, can you just leave the city or, or transport yourself or quit or whatever? Like... You know, if you wanna, if you wanna, if you wanna add that kind of shit to it, then do it. But like, have it make logical sense? I don't know. It, it, I mean, this movie is based in the night in, in the late nineties, so maybe there, there were things that people felt like doing like that. I don't know. It's a bit weird. But I like, like I said, I liked that there was a conflict with him. Like he really felt bad for killing. Like you felt really bad for killing uh, Birkin and and Annette uh, specifically. And obviously, like he says, like he even tells Joe he wasn't, gonna, or he tells the girl he wasn't going to shoot her. He wasn't going to shoot the kid. 
Um, and obviously, like, he ends up apologizing to Chris and Jill. So there is that whole thing there where it's like, he's not a full-on bad guy. And it's going to be interesting to see how they do his character in, in the sequels, if we even get sequels. I mean, it'll be very interesting that if they do end up doing Cole Veronica, it'll be interesting to get a Wesker who doesn't want to fight Chris, but, like, because he's got this mission, or maybe they do something with his powers or whatever, where they try to explain maybe he has to do something, otherwise he, he, he'll he die. Maybe that's what drives him a bit bad. And then maybe they can give him his umbrella backstory later on. Like maybe they can reveal that he is a Wesker child or Wesker children part of the experiment. And when they end up adapting Resident Evil 5 and that makes him go insane and he ends up becoming like full on evil. That would be kind of cool. But overall what they did with his character, I thought it was fine. I wanted to see more but I enjoyed what I got. In, ter in terms of the worst character in this movie, I'm going to say it's Leon S. Kennedy. Okay, He's played by the guy who played that uh, guru guy in Zombieland 2. Um, the actor is fine. Again, he does a decent job, but the problem with his Leon is that he's made to be a joke. Everyone takes the piss out of him. When you first see him, he's, he's in bed, he's getting up, he's getting dressed to go to work, and he's in the diner sleeping. Uh, and you've got Wesker and Joe basically playing, and, and the other officers playing pranks on him. And then you've got Irons basically screaming in his face constantly. You've got Joe screaming in his face. They basically make him look like shit, like he's a dumbass. And he's got this whole backstory of his dad being this great cop, whatever, like, he got transported, like, I don't know, it's so weird what they do with Leon in here. And then they have him, like, like, to be honest, I didn't mind it, because here's the thing, uh, when it comes to these characters, in, in like, at least when it comes to the Resident Evil 1 characters, you have to keep this in mind, right? It... When you played the your, when you played the original game, think about this for a second, when you played the original game, right, the very first Resident Evil game, did the characters in those games have any sort of uh, personality? And, and and I'm mainly talking about Chris and Joe. Did they have any personality besides being the heroes? The answer would be no. They 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 were sort of blank slates. Sure, you you sure you could say, well, they had these backstories. Yeah, that's if you read the fire, you know, the book that that comes with it, and it would tell you the backstories. But if you didn't read that and you just jumped into the game, Joe and Chris didn't really have much of a personality. It's like. Yeah, Chris is basically the macho hero, and Joe is the macho badass, female badass. You know, Barry and Rebecca had more sort of personalities than they did. But the point is, they didn't really have much of character to them. Now, obviously, with the with the sequels, they obviously they ended up having more of a personality because you know sequels. But uh, with this movie, obviously, it kind of makes sense that they had to sort of give them new personalities to delve into. And that's fine. I didn't mind that. Like, I'm not going to go into the whole thing of complaining and screaming racism. Like, they changed the characters' looks and that. Uh, would I prefer a Leon that looks like Leon from the from the games? Yeah, I would have preferred that. But that's, that's mainly for the simple fact that, you know, when I think of Leon, I think of the blonde, white uh, Hollywood wannabe that he's supposed to be, like... You know, that's what I think of. When I think of Jill, I think of... Well, I don't know. I don't know what I think of when I think of Jill. I just think of, uh, yeah, the, the white-skinned, badass chick who can open a lock and use a lot of machinery. I don't know. When, uh, when you really sit down and think about it, the, the game characters do not have a lot of personality, to be honest. And at least this movie tries to do something in terms of giving them some sort of personality. And that's fine. But it's a bit weird when you have your movie trying to do recreate as accurately as it can these set pieces, right? Or these uh, these moments or these locations. But then when it comes to the characters, their personalities or, and their appearances are very far off different. And then, uh, you know, you still have to sit there and go, what was the point then? Like, what is the point? But, you know, overall, I didn't mind it. Because in the, in the end of the day, it's not Alice. Do you know what I mean? It's Chris, it's Claire, it's Leon, and Jill, and Wesker. You know, they're using those characters. When it comes to other characters, like Richard, for example, yeah, I, I wish they would have done more with characters like him. Like, he just, like I said, he just sort of gets killed off by a horde of zombies. I would have preferred if they'd sort of given him a sacrificial death. Like, they could have given him uh, this death where he saves Chris uh, at the cost of his own life, and that would have been cool to see, but we don't get that. He just dies, and then that's it. It's like, oh, he's dead. Okay, whatever. Uh, Enrico, you know, he ends up taking Keno's place, being the one that gets, like, eh, chewed on, and he's sort of an arsehole to Leon. Same with Dooley. It's like, it's a bit weird that they kind of do that, like, you know, you could have just had it be Kenneth. Uh, you could have had it be Forrest. I don't know, like, yeah, again, weird. Um, 
Annette and Sherry were just completely pointless to have in this film. They could have just had it be completely Birkin. I don't get why they had to add his family. If you're going to add them, at least have Annette be the other scientist, do you know what I mean? And, and, and working with Birkin and maybe trying to discourage him from doing what he's doing and Birkin sort of like fighting back going, no, I need to do this, blah, blah, this is my life's work, etc, etc. You can't tell me what to do. You, you helped me on this and it's like, I did and it was a bloody mistake. They could have done some sort of relationship similar to that. But instead, they're just there in the background, and they get no development. And it's like, it's like, what is the point of having these characters in here? What is the point? Do you know what I mean? And it, it and it's just very annoying. But other than that, uh, like I said, the movie, like I said, the the, the story structure is fine. The characters are sort of fine. It's just like it's not long enough to to give you the necessary character development. Everything is just like. It's just a point A to B, basically, kind of story. The music is meh, to be honest. I, again, I would have, I would have, I would have had someone maybe do remixes of the original game soundtrack for this, but instead we get this generic sort of horror-like music, and it's like meh, whatever. I, I want to say I enjoyed this film, and I did, I did sort of enjoy it, but at the same time, it's like, honestly, this movie was not fun. That's my biggest problem with this film. It's not a fun film. Okay, it's a very slow driven, boring kind of movie, uh, with very questionable CGI at times, uh, and with questionable characters forced into it, like, they could have done such a better job with this film if it had been longer, and if they just sort of sat down and gone, we don't need these characters, we don't need this characters, we can put this character here and have him die, and this here, and we can make this movie slightly longer, but like... It, it just sort it just hurts my head really like how low budget this feels compared to the other mo Resident Evil movies and how much fun those other movies are like because as much as I like to shit on the Paul W.S. Anderson movies at least when I watch them I have some sort of fun do you know what I mean like I said my biggest problem with those movies was the simple fact that they did not respect their own lore and mythology but uh, at least they were fun to watch. This one, it's just sort of a struggle, really, because like, uh, because it gets it gets a lot right, but then it gets a lot wrong, and it's like, god damn it, you were this close on doing a nice adaptation. This could have been the best video game adaptation ever, but like, you missed the mark. But by this much, it's like you did this right, but then you did this so wrong, and it's like, god damn it, like, this could have been so much more. And you can tell that the director tried. You can tell they tried. They tried. They really did try this time around. Like, you, like these people clearly did give a crap and they tried. But, again, they didn't try hard enough. And it, it, it comes to a point of where, like, where I'm like, if, if, there, if, you know, depending on what the deleted scenes are, and I'm sure there are going to be plenty of deleted scenes, I'm probably going to be sitting there going, why didn't you keep this in there? And if there aren't, it's going to be a case of, you could have made this movie better, basically. And now it comes a case of, if there is going to be a sequel, how good is a sequel going to be? Like, what are you going to change? What are you going to take? What are you going to put in? Because obviously, clearly, the next sequel is going to be called Veronica. But how are you going to do that when you have when using characters like, you know... Because you've got to continue the story of these characters specifically, right? So, and that leads me to this thing. That leads me to this, because I think the director himself said that he wants to do Cold Veronica and Resident Evil 4. As I was saying, Cole Veronica, I guess I guess what they could do with that is basically adapt. They're obviously gonna have to adapt the, the game, but like what I'm what I'm trying to say is obviously you can have Chris, Claire, Jill, and Leon try and sneak into wherever the HQ for Umbrella is now and and um, have this whole thing. Did the door just open? Loki, stop opening the door and coming in. Sit there. So you can have this whole thing where they obviously try to sneak into the European base, but then Claire gets captured. Maybe Claire and Leon get captured and they get sent to Rockford Island. And instead of having uh, Stephen Burnside, you can just have Claire and Leon, basically, like, like the original game was supposed to have. And then you have Chris and Jill work together, or maybe just have Chris, or maybe he meets with Barry Burr. Maybe we can introduce Barry Burr or Rebecca or whatever, and they go there to get Claire and Leon back. And Wesker comes in, and you have this whole thing with Wesker, maybe Ada, I don't know, maybe just Wesker, right? And, and obviously the Ashford Twins, and you adapt that entire storyline as good as you can. And then the next one, Resident Evil, the third movie would be an adaptation of Resident Evil 4. Uh, maybe you can have it where instead of Ashley getting kidnapped, it's Sherry that gets... I keep saying this, like, I keep saying that the original plot for Resident Evil 4 should have been Sherry getting kidnapped. And Leon trying to rescue her, you can do that, you can introduce Ada going in, and then... Uh, 
maybe combine Lost in Nightmares with it, where Chris and Claire come in at the end. Maybe you can have the villain. It's not being sad like it's Oswald E. Spencer. Maybe like he's like in the movie they they they, they give you this quick backstory of how the Spencer Mansion was was he's basically and he was the founder of Umbrella and he died. But you can easily just say no, he he isn't dead. He is alive. He is still alive. He's in the background manipulating things and he can Wesker coming in and he finds out that he's this experiment and he loses his shit. He kills Spencer and Jill ends up flinging herself out with him. And then, and then the last movie would be an adaptation of Resident Evil. You know, Resident Evil 4 film would be an adaptation of the Resident Evil 5 game. Uh, you bring all the characters back, Africa, whatever, Chris, Jill, uh, you know, uh, Chris trying to save Jill, being for me in mind control, Wesker, like he's gone full on nuts, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And, you know, there, there you go. You've got, the, you've got these decent four movies, basically, that sort of adapted the other games as, as good as they could. And then if you wanted to, you could continue on with an adaptation of, uh, of the Resident Evil 6 game or Revelations 2 or something. Do you know what I mean? Like, but that's kind of how I see it. That's how kind of how I see where they could go with it. And that would work brilliantly. But yeah, as as this first film, I, I guess it's fine. It's just, it could have been so much better done. It becomes a case of, am I going to buy this on Blu-ray or not? I probably will. I probably will buy this on Blu-ray because as, as a Resident Evil nut... I, I'd, I'd want the collection, so I'm probably am going to buy this uh, in order to support, oh Christ, in order to support whatever sequel we hopefully will get, but uh, that's just me. Anyway guys, that's uh, my review. I hope you liked it. And as always, remember to like and subscribe. I shall see you when I shall see you. Take care and...